Well, hello, good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live on news up here at Desawe Kanda. I am Alfred Okonse. Coming up tonight, key candidate in the new Patriotic Party flagbearer race, Alan Kojo Chermantin, pulls out of the November 4 contest, accusing the party of having skewed the Special Delegates Congress in favor of a particular candidate. What does this mean for the party? We we'll speak to political analysts and also a member of the Alan Chumantin campaign team that's been giving indication of exactly what's going to be the next step. Stay with us. Also, the Office of Special Prosecutor, in a dramatic turn of events, re-seizes the money found at the home of former Sanitation Minister Cecilia Bernadapa after it was released to her following the High Court's order. The OSP has also refrozen her bank accounts. We have all the details plus some legal analysis. Stay with us here on Ghana Tonight. Also, President Kufado says his government's efforts in dealing with illegal mining is yielding positive results. He's been addressing the African leaders on the ongoing African Climate Summit in Kenya. But environmental advocates disagree with the president's position on this matter. Say the evidence of illegal mining is still staring us in the face. So they are questioning whether the president is talking about the same Ghana that we are in, that we're seeing the impact of illegal mining. So they'll join us. We have a conversation tonight. As always, let's hear from you. You're an integral part of the show. The hashtag we're using is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get talking. Let's settle for Ghana Briefs. Former Trades and Industry Minister Alan Chermatin has withdrawn from the new Patriotic Party presidential race. In a statement, he cites the process being skewed in favor of one candidate and intimidation of his supporters. The Office of the Special Prosecutor has re-seized monies from Cecilia Dapes residence and refrozing her bank account after returning them and defreezing the account in compliance with earlier court orders. Special Prosecutor Kisye Jabeng in a statement noted that the office has only exercised its statutory powers. <music> The Public Accounts Committee of Parliament is considering inviting the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission, GTEC, and universities to address the delay in accrediting new programs or renewing existing ones. In the view of the chairman of the committee, James Kluche Afeji, the prolonged accreditation process for university programs adversely affects students who require their certificates for further education or employment. There is a need for us to bring the two bodies together so that we'll look at where the problem is and how we can iron it so that we don't examine students on programs and courses that do not have accreditation. As government struggles to end illegal mining, the paramount chief of Mampong has taxed his colleagues not to allow mining in their areas. Dasibra Osebun Sude II cautions even with authorization from the Minerals Commission, he won't allow the mining of gold within his jurisdiction. Some of us paramounties have been bold and we've stuck our neck and test, test out to challenge government established commissions, mineral commission, etc., etc. Far from sounding boastful, I kick them out of my kingdom that you can't come to Mount Paul to come and dig any hole that you want gold. This, this cancerous galamse taking place in Ghana, good source of drinking waters, all polluted and gone. <music> Minister of Finance Ken Ofriata has expressed optimism about the country meeting all reviews in order to access the second tranche of the IMF program. Ghana is seeking a $3 billion bailout, of which $600,000 has already been accessed in the first tranche. 
Kenufriata made this known at the third CEO's breakfast meeting organized by the Ghana Investments Promotion Center in Accra. We have the first review of the IMF this year and uh, in September the fund will be with us. Um, looking at really the quantitative performance criteria, um, the indicated targets and some of the structural benchmarks. I think we've made a lot of progress in all of that and we expect um, that when the mission comes and uh, we'll be able to get a self-level agreement and then be able to go to the board in November. That's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. Coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, key candidate in the new protective party flag were raised. Alan Kojocha Martin pulls out of the November 4 contest, accusing the party of having skewed the special delegates' congress in favor of a particular candidate. Eventually, now we're getting to know what this particular candidate is or who the candidate is. And what does this really mean for, for the party? we we'll speak to a political analyst sh shortly, joining us here. On, on Ghana tonight, but um, Yabwabi Asangwa, who, uh, who speaks for Alakoto Chamantin's uh, campaign team, indicated earlier that this particular candidate that they are accusing the party of skewing this special delegates congress to favor him is the establishment candidate. And we all know that Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya has been widely described as the establishment candidate by both elements within the NPP and without. So. There's really no doubt about the person that they are talking about in this instance. But let me take you through the statement, brief aspects of this statement that Alan Chamanting released earlier. And I'll be joined by Professor Ransu Jampo shortly. And he is a, a professor of political science at the University of Ghana. And William Evans Incom, who is our Northern Bureau Chief and our Chief Ascension Regional Correspondent, will be monitoring this since the last 24 hours. We're here uh, at TV3. And so take a look at this. This is what he earlier put out. That's Alan Chimanting in the statement. On Sunday, the 27th of August, 2023, I issued a public statement which made reference to the selection and shortlisting of presidential aspirants by the Special Electoral College convened by the NPP on the 26th of August. It goes on to say that after having carefully analyzed the results of the said elections, it is absolutely clear to me from events leading to during and after the elections that the special delegates conference was strategically and tactically take note of these two words skewed in favor of one particular aspirant the level of intimidation of varying intensity directly and indirectly unleashed on a significant number of delegates at various voting centers across the 16 regions is unprecedented in the history of the npp in addition, the fact that my polling agent in the Northeast region, and we're going to show you that shortly, has suffered severe damage to his eyesight, arising from his bold and courageous effort to ensure compliance with the very rules and regulations for the conduct of the elections, as approved by the Presidential Elections Committee, will forever remain a dark spot in the history of uh, the internal elections of the MPP. This incident, that's the, what happened to the Northeast agent of Alan, and various acts of violence and collusion reported in other voting centers are appalling, unconscionable, and despicable. It says, I'm committed to and, and value the safety of those who work with me and for me, and I always fight for their safety. It goes on and on, essentially saying that, look, he has taken the decision to withdraw from the race, and in the coming days, we will get to know his decision and what he's going to do in Ghana politics. I'm not talking about the MPP. Now, take a look at the, the Northeast agent of Alan Chimanting, whom he referred to in this statement. The, the, the man who was left with very serious injuries to his, his right eye. He's still receiving treatment. A week ago, he, was, he had to be flown to Accra to get some treatment. Take a look. Alan Tremontain first visited his Northeast region agent who was allegedly attacked during the Super Delegates Conference. The flag bearer aspirant who placed third in the election said he will not countenance any such behavior going forward. What happened to my colleague on Saturday was an act of total indiscipline 
and indecent behavior. How do we, as a decent party, going into an election, particularly at the level of superdelegates, superintend such behavior? I mean, look, we all joined the MPP because of our commitment to the values of the party. But what is happening clearly shows that this is not what we bargained for by joining the party. I'm not going to tolerate this kind of behavior. It doesn't make sense. His agent, Zakaria Ali, narrated his ordeal. The third person was the original youth organizer. He voted and displayed his vote. So I confronted him and told him, my brother, that is not the way, the rule of the game. We are told that no one should use a phone to snap when you vote. Secondly, we have been told that no one should vote and display his vote. Oh, when I said he picked a plus here and hit me, so I blocked him this way. Well, so that's Zakaria there, um, left with very unfortunate situation having to deal with the injury to his eye. Eventually, Richard Nyama, whom you saw in that video as well, he's one of the spokespersons for Alan Chamantin's campaign team, said on this show a week ago that the party was yet to reach out to them, even concerning the injury that this agent had had to suffer. Yabwabea Samoa spoke earlier, indicating that they are very clear in their minds that the special delegates conference was skewed to favor the establishment candidate who has been widely described as Dr. Mahmoud Baumia by some members within the party and without. Take a look. This is, this is not an event. This is a process. And right from the beginning, it's a process that's been fraught with problems. Uh, problems of uh, uh, deliberate skewing, orchestration, and, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, intimidation, inducements, essentially fear has been at work. And it's all directed at restricting Mr. Chematin's ability to engage in a fair uh, process. It's only fair that or he has the courage of his convictions to step up and say, if this is the way it's going, I'm afraid I have to step out. And, mm -hmm. and in doing so, he's assured his supporters, no more supporters, well we said stakeholders who have high expectations of him, that these expectations will be realized given the process. Because the process is such that it will not throw up willingly a person that's on the heart of the party. And therefore, there's no point in him continuing. But so that's Yababi and Samoa there. Now you, you understand uh, some of the concerns. And for those of you who are seeing this, this incident that happened to his North East, course, that's agent for the first time, this is it. Professor Ransford Jampo is a professor of political science at the University of Ghana, Lagon, and, and also uh, William Evans Sinkum is a Northern Bureau Chief. Is joining us. Gentlemen, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. I'll start off with you, William. We picked this information about 24 hours ago. It's about yesterday, around the same time that Alan Chamanting was going to withdraw from the race. Is it not? Absolutely, it was. And of course, he was also in the Ashanti region to consult with a number of people um, here in as much as he did not win or garnered the uh, expected vote during the 26th October, sorry, August uh, Special Delegate Congress. It doesn't also negate the fact that he still um, has a number of people who also support him. For instance, uh, if you're talking about the leadership of the FAP party, then you're talking about the former Ashanti Regional Minister, and of course, Minister for uh, um, Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs, S.K. Boafu. Um, it was one of those people who was in his camp. I mean, you're talking about um, the, some of the founding fathers of the NPP in the Ashanti region. A, a sizable number of them were with him when he was embarking uh, on a campaign train as far as the Ashanti region was concerned, ahead of the August 26th uh, uh, Special Delegate Congress. So he was here to consult with them uh, before this particular statement came out. And, and we understand that... Um... Also, the to say to another, we're, we're robbing at a point. Is this information that you have? Well, absolutely. That's what we. Well, I'm, I'm picking on the ground that uh, he also went to Mexico. Of course, I mean, don't forget that when 
um, he retired from his position or relinquished his position as the trade minister. His first port of call was the Mensha Palace. In fact, he, he visited the palace two occasions. One, right after his, he relinquished his position as a trade minister, he came to see Otunfo, but it wasn't official. He formed Otunfo about the decision to contest, but he gave him a subtle information that he has his eyes on the ball, even though um, he came to Mensha with some investors um, whom he introduced to him for just some few days after relinquishing his position as the trade and industry minister. Then he came again to officially inform the overall of the Shanti Kingdom that yes, now he is very clear in his mind that he will be contesting for this particular position. And when Otunfo was blessing him, there, was, there were two significant things that uh, Otunfo said that and let me, I, I will say it in three and then do the translation. Media, could you, media, mini, bibia, the midi, jow, a sike, jacofi, to which I have nothing to give you, but I am, I am backing you with the golden stool. So, the exactly, the, exactly what Utunfo told him on that very day that he visited Mencia and, of course, officially informed the overlord that he will be vying for the flag bearership position. It was then after that he came to the Ashanti region to at least um, kind of engage with some identifiable groups as far as the MPP is concerned. So uh, for him to have met Utunfo as the information was circulating as far as the Ashanti region is concerned, isn't something weird or I mean something strange uh, as far as political engagement or I mean consulting the Ashanti uh, is concerned. Definitely he will have to consult him why, or you have to tell him why he 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 is withdrawing from the race. William, stay with me. Um, there's a reason why the Ashanti region is key um, in, in all of this, right? Um, take a look at this: the Alan Chomantin's vote pathing when it comes to the delegates, the NPP's national delegates conference to elect either the flag bearer or the special delegates sometime in 2014. I'm going to put something on the screen right now. This bar graph shows a trend, right? Um, and that's what the Baumia team has, has also been putting out there, that, well, his influence has been dwindling over the period. So this news of he withdrawing is, is not so much of a news to them because they were expecting it. In 2007, that contest that had 17 people contesting for the flag bearership of the MPP, Alan pulled some 32.3% of the total vote cast. In 2010, ahead of the 2012 elections, 19.91. Then in 2014, that was the first time they did a super delegates conference, right? And that's when he pulled 9.8%. Then during the uh, flag bearer race proper, 4.75%. Then this super delegates conference, Two weeks, almost two weeks ago, 10.29%. Okay, so you'll see that that path of that dwindling voting pattern in there. But then if you look at the Ashanti region as well, where you are and which has been described as the stronghold of Alan Chamantin, what happened in the Super Delegates Conference? Let's take a look at this. What happened in the Ashanti region? And, and Evans, I'm going to find out from you how the people in the Ashanti region have been reacting to this. This is the results that, from the region during the Super Delegates Conference. Baumia 97, Alan 10, Kennedy Japan 6. And he, Alan Chomantin, in a statement, makes reference to some machinations that led to even his stronghold suffering some some impact as well how are the people in the region reacting to this considering that this place has been described as alan chomantin's stronghold well so i mean even right or proud to the 26th august special delegate congress there were some chorus of indignation among a section of his supporters um, saying that well, this whole thing is being skewed so i quite remember during the campaign trail um, when I was following Alan Kojo Chematen, of course, also to also establish that I also followed Dr. Mahmoud Baumia throughout. Uh, so when I was on the Alan Kojo Chematen campaign, 
um, uh, consistently they were saying that, well, the special delegate Congress is not something that they are focusing on. Uh, they know that they may not be popular as far as that electoral college um, in us concerned, but they only need that leeway. They only need that passage to be part of the November 4 um, uh, General Delegate Congress, um, which of, of course will have some excess of 200,000 delegates voting in that particular exercise. And that is where um, they believe that they, their strength lies. Right. So they were never um, interested. I mean, from 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 uh, several conversations that I had with, I mean, some of the followers of uh, Alan Kojic Mati, they were never interested in the special delegate. But nonetheless, they were also not expecting to be fed. They felt that well, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia would definitely lead in that race. They are likely to occupy the second position. So the third position came as a shock to them. I see. Uh, and William, st uh, stay with me. Um, uh, let me go on to Professor Ransford Jampo. Um, I think that the Zoom of Professor Jampo is stable now. Professor Jampo, thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. Now, this is the Dr. Baumia's campaign team narrative about this, this announcement of Alan Chumanting pulling out of the race, that uh, they were expecting it. It was expected uh, because of how things played out in the Special Delegates Congress. Did this come to you as a surprise as well, from where you sit? Well, earlier on, I'm sure you may have interviewed me or I may have hinted or warned in one of your programs on key points that um, if the grounds upon which the battle was going to be fought was not even, and if people are perceived to have, people who are expected to be independent arbiters are seen to have taken sides, then it could spell doom for the party because it was going to be likely that some of the aspirants may pull out of the race. I said that um, we didn't hear the kinds of things that went on in the superdelegates election. All that we heard was that one man who was a supporter or, a, or an agent of Alan Sherman team was severely beaten to the point that it affected one of his eyes. That's all we heard. But if you look at the content of the letter that Alan Sherman team wrote, which is in the public domain, it speaks to a certain diabolic intimidation mechanisms that got instituted. And so for him, it scared so many people who would have voted for him from voting for him and all that. And if you go through elections with that kind of intimidatory machinery, you do not create a level playing field. He mentioned the kind of utterances by some top echelons of the party before, during, and after the uh, superdelegate elections. And you recall that I'd always also want that uh, a certain segment of the echelons of the party were oftentimes caught insinuating in a particular manner that gave them give them out as having taken sides and these things were not helpful they could fit into the uh, the threat that it is uh, that whoever finds the grounds or the field on even may likely uh, want to go his um, separate way and so um if today we are being to what I want about mm -hmm. actually did happen, then um, the consequential result is that people who feel peeved may want to just go on, on you know, go, go their own way. But don't forget, um, if people are saying that this was to be expected, I mean, if in, I mean, we should we should brace ourselves and and 
shed arrogance and fashion out measures that would uh, deal with the threats of people in the persona or the pedigree of Alan uh, moving out of such a race. If you say it is to be expected, then why did you fight the election in that manner? I mean, if you know that he was going to go away, uh, then why why were you intimidating? Why are you intimidating, mm -hmm. if it is true, are you intimidating right. for the person to just move away? If they say it is to be expected, are they also expecting other people, other contenders, other aspirants to also pull out of the November um, 4 race? If they're expecting other aspirants to also pull out, they should let us know. But I'm telling them, that if care is not taken before November 4, other contenders will also pull out. Are they expecting that one to? And so it's not about being arrogant and saying anything. Right. It's about being sober and doing introspection, rethinking the kinds of issues that the man raised with a view to ensuring that it so, doesn't some, some level of response is given to it. But uh, Prof, I like uh, Boache Jacon, you know, when he pulled out, the party issued a statement almost immediately we're yet to hear anything official from the party as yet about Alan Chimantin's decision but what will be the impact on the party with this particular decision that Alan has just taken the point must be made that the MPP now is seeking to break an eight um, unless of course they do not mean it uh, my own um, view, sometimes interacting with some of them, um, it's mixed because some really mean the 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 cliche, the, um, the idea of breaking the eight, and for some too, you can just um, deduce from the way and manner they go about um, the activities that they are not really serious about breaking any way any eight. And also, I will tell you that for some of them, they are actually parking away. Even though they are talking about breaking the eight, some of them are actually parking. They are parking, parking away. And so if those who really are interested or they mean business when they talk about breaking the eight, if they truly are there and they mean business of breaking the eight, then they should be concerned that, you see, when the party was together, a party that had all its top echelons together, a party that had all people who had the pedigree to contribute into increasing their electoral fortunes when they were all together in one party, they couldn't break any eight. If a party that was together could not break any eight, then as for a party that is plagued with schisms and people pulling out of races and people going their own way, the least said about it, the better. And so, unless the party is really joking with us and they are not interested in breaking any eight. Then they should really be worried about this um, um, occurrence. And mm. to insinuate or to talk about the fact that, well, this is the man and he's done that before right. and that is his talking trait. He's going to do it. It is, you see, it is only a statement or expression or reaction from uninquiring minds. Okay. Because the pedigree of Alan in yesteryears is not the same as the pedigree of Alan today. Mm. He's been around for a long time. He is the law is the one of the ministers who, who gave all loyalty, all manner of loyalty to President Akufuado. In 2007, when he decided to see power or to um, um give his political yes. career um, to allow President Akufuado, Akufuado, yes. um, um to go for that reason, to bid for his time. He was not as popular, or he had not gained that much experience like he has today. And so, whether you like it or not, he has following within the party. And you believe it in a fool's paradise to say that if he has following, why did he perform that um, uh, abysmally in the superdelegates? But he's now explaining that he may, his performance may well be as a result of intimidation. And if people are intimidated, they act in a certain way 
um, that may not be in accordance with their own with conscience. Their own conscience, indeed. Professor Ross, for jump, appreciate your time and your input on this, as always. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. It's a professor of political science at the University of Ghana, Legon. And so to you as well, William Evansinkum, thank you. Uh, for connecting with us on this. And I know you have your eyes and your ears on the ground for some more, uh, the aftermath of this announcement. So we'll definitely be connecting with you going forward. Thank you. Great, bro. That William Evans Incom is our Northern Bureau Chief here at Media General. Coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, the Office of Special Prosecutor in a dramatic turn of events has had to receive the money found at the home of the former sanitation minister, Cecilia Abnadapa, after it was released to her following the High Court order. The OSP has also refrozen her bank accounts. We have details on that um, following up. Now, the, here's how things are, are, are looking like now. And let me give you an idea of what happened today with the special prosecutor. That's gone to re-seize the monies from Cicely Adapas residence. You know, the, that over $570,000 and over 2 million CDs that the OSP found at the Abilene Bay residence of Cecilia Abinadapa. He froze that or seized that. Then he sought a freezing order from the High Court, which was shut down. Take a look at this. Let me put that on the screen right now. You follow me every step of the way, how things played out. And lawyer Matik Bebo is going to be joining us in a bit. The OSP issued a statement earlier today indicating that it had complied with the ruling and order of the High Court dated 31st of August 2023, by unfreezing the frozen bank accounts and investment of Cecilia Adapa. There are seven bank accounts involved. The OSP said they also returned the seized cash sums, the 270, oh, that's over $570,000 and over 2 million CDs that was seized at the residence of Cecilia Adapa and assent of Ms. Dapa and her lawyers. The satisfaction by the OSP of the orders of the High Court terminates the proceedings of the seizure of the cash amounts. From Ms. Dapa commenced on 24th of July 2023 and the freezing of her bank account and investments that also effected from 26th of July. Subsequent to the indicated ruling and order of the High Court and the compliance by the OSP with the said ruling and order, the special prosecutor considered that the freezing of the bank account and investment of Cecilia Dapa is necessary to facilitate ongoing investigation. So therefore, the special prosecutor has invoked his statutory power under section 38.1 of Act 959 and Regulation 19.1 of LI 2374, directing the freezing of the bank accounts and investment of Cecilia Dapa effective today, the 5th of September 2023. Subsequent to the indicated ruling and order of the High Court and the compliance by the OSP with the said ruling and order, the special prosecutor also considers that he has reasonable grounds to suspect that the cash amounts seized from and returned to Cecilia Dapa is tainted property. And it is necessary to exercise the power of seizure to prevent concealment or loss of, of said cash amount. So that's what's happening now. And goes on to talk about um, invoking his statutory powers under Section 32.1A of Act 959 by directing the seizure of uh, from Cecilia Dapa, the cash amounts involved. And that is what um, has led to all of this. And then also uh, now the decision by the OSP to freeze the bank accounts of Cecilia Dapa again. And that, that has also generated a lot of uh, reaction, especially because if you recall, um, the likes of lawyer Martin Bebo described the mistake by OSP as elementary in the first instance. Martin Pebo is joining us on Zoom. He's a private legal practitioner. He's a leader of one of three individual bond order groups and the convener for the Kumi Prekurilo de demonstration. Well, Martin Pebo, thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. So you see that I think the OSP is just going by one of the recommendations you made that, you know what, comply with the court order, but then just go back and, and, and seize the money and freeze the account Again, make, make an application for that. That's what's happening, is it not? Yes. Yes. So, and you know, on Saturday, uh, I predicted it, that that's what would happen, that OSU will give Madame Dapas money back to her, and then when she gets to the 
front gate of the OSB. They would then call her, oh, madam, one more thing. And then say, oh, but we have to re-seize. Yeah, that's a sad thing. But well, uh, it's happened. When I say sad, it's because I was hoping that in the first court ruling, because this was likely to happen, I was hoping that at least uh, his lordship would have navigated the application well to avoid this one. But it had to happen because look, Africa. So you see how we are now saying Ose Kisi, Ose Kisi, Ose Kisi, like what we do to our football teams. Yes. Hey, Charlie, because there's no way we could look at the laws and allow Madame Dapa to go with the money. You see how now with what the court is done, it's for the OSP to now say that Madame Dapa's story is what? Inconsistent, etc. Yeah, because look, she hasn't shown she's running a business. Look, from day one, if she had a company that was producing so much and selling and she had money and she could explain this, you think the company wouldn't have come out? They would have. Listen, I mean, let's let's stop the sophistry, okay? It's simple. So far, Madam Dapa hasn't demonstrated that she can earn that income from being a minister. Mm -hmm. So there's no way we're going to just sit and let her take the money back under some rules. So this had to happen. So it's all Ose Kisi, Ose Kisi, right? But, 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 but lawyer, I, I recall that in the first instance, you described the mistake by, well, omission by uh, Kisia Jabeng, the, the OSP, as elementary and that he was supposed to give the details or disclose the details of this bank account that he was hoping that the judge will grant him the freezing order for. And you said that that omission was elementary. Now he's going back again. So you would expect that well, the details of this bank account he's seeking to freeze, the monies in there should be, should be disclosed and made public? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what has to be done. And let me clarify this. You know, as we do this analysis, there are two applications involved. The seizure of the currency, that's a, let's just call it $600,000. This 590 is long. 600000 is easier to remember, about $600,000, which is equivalent, equivalent to at least 10, 12 million Ghana cities. Huge sum, right? That is about 600000 and the 2.7 million that was found in the house, that's what they call seizure. It was seized physically. So you are holding something, and then I take it by force, seizure. So that one falls under Section 32 of the Office of Special Prosecutor Act, the Act 959. So that's the one that for uh, this in the analysis we did, we're thinking that the judge could have saved the situation because that's where the OSP was thrown out. Uh, Kisi was thrown out because he didn't go within seven days after seizing the money. That's the rule. If you seize anything physically, go within seven days. And that's what we're saying that, look, time, there are a thousand and one timelines in the court rules in things we do in court that if you don't obey the timeline, it doesn't hurt. So we're hoping that his uh, Justice Chum would have used one to save the situation. It didn't happen. The one I talked about, the elementary mistake, was the freezing of the account. And that's where Justice Chum cannot be faulted because that place there, it's like you said, Jabin didn't disclose the, uh, the details he has about the account because there are, he got some information. That's how come he got to know the account, et cetera. But that's it, he didn't release all, you see. So that place, and that's the one falling under section 38 of the, Office of Special Prosecutor Act, Section 38. That's the one that says if you freeze the account administratively, so the OSP starts by sending a letter to the bank or any other financial institution to say, look, the money belonging to Mr. X, Madam Y, is frozen automatically, administratively, okay, until you hear from me from court. So that one, you have 14 days. And then that means that within the 14 days, go to court for an order to continue beyond 14. So that's the one that when he went to court, he didn't give enough details and he didn't tell the court enough things about the way Madame Dapa has no defense to this case. And you see, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is the one we are hoping that this time he'll give further details for the judge to see that, quite, this is a very serious case because 
from what we are hearing in one of the accounts, the volume of transactions is about five million dollars. Yes, Mr. Okansi, you heard me right. Mm -hmm. Five million dollars, not the last balance, volume of transactions. So today, maybe one dollar is paid in today, tomorrow, twenty-five dollars, then uh, two weeks later, two hundred thousand dollars. So etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And when you add, you get a total figure of five million dollars over a period. Mm -hmm. Okay, that she was in office and very relevant to the investigation. Then the other, then this five million dollars, if you multiply by twelve, I think we are getting about uh, five times twelve. Is that sixty? Yes. Uh, about That's sixty. Two. That's sixty. Yeah, so sixty million Ghana, right? Yes. And then you come to the CD account. That one to the volume of transactions we hear is forty-eight million Ghana. What work did Madame Dapa do to end such income? What work? And you think that if she had done any work? Since July and in well over a month, she can't explain if you're doing legitimate business, running a legitimate company, selling products, rendering services, by now, ah, even the workers, even assuming management didn't want to talk, workers would have whispered to their friends and their friends would have brought it to social media that, hey, Madame Dapa, you are joking with, hey, she's owner of this business and that business. By all means, something would have leaked. As long as there are workers there, once they find that, they are uh, there's some patrons, uh, there's some businesses, uh, that's the very business they earn a living from is being threatened. Sure, they would have unilaterally taken action to come to the public that come and see what we do, X, Y, Z, you know. Yeah, but you see nobody. I see her initial attempt to say the one million that was found in her home belongs to a diseased brother unraveled. It totally unraveled. Mm. You see how the... Uh, diseased brother's widow got a lawyer, lawyer Kusi. You were about to sue, yeah. and to, so Madame Dapa her, her share retreat. of the money. Mm. Yeah, so you see mm. that she beat a retreat. That tells you that Charlie uh, is hot, it's hot, it's hot. It's really, really hot for her. We'll, we'll see how things play out in the coming days. It's, it's very interesting uh, days to watch ahead of us, and I, I really do appreciate your input as always and staying up to, to join us, lawyer Martin Pebble. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. He's a private legal practitioner. is um, also the convener for the Kumi Peculiar Demonstration. He's been following this since the other part OSP case for, for quite a while and has some extensive knowledge on it. But coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, President Kofuado says his government's efforts in dealing with illegal mining is yielding positive results. He was addressing African leaders at the ongoing Africa Climate Summit in Kenya. But some environmental advocates disagree with the president. We'll tell you why. Stay with us after this quick break. We'll be back shortly. This is Ghana Tonight. Now, President Kufado says government's efforts in dealing with illegal mining, popularly known as Galam says, is yielding positive results. Large tracts of Ghana's vegetation continue to suffer with water bodies polluted, resulting in, among many things, an increase in water tariffs, as we've seen, him not helping uh, the Ghana Water Company treat the water. But he was addressing the gathering of African leaders at the ongoing Africa Climate Summit in uh, Kenya, Nairobi. However, the, the president said the ban on illegal mining and flagship projects like One Village, One Dam is contributing to the fight against climate change. Take a look. Streamline access to international climate finance to complement national funding. I believe this forum will throw more light on practical ways to mobilize financial resources to support the implementation of national climate actions, especially how we can guarantee a different future from the past and ensure that the commitments of the developed world towards climate finance which have not been met in the past, will be met in the future. Excellencies, it is obvious that we have to act swiftly and decisively to mitigate these effects and ensure a sustainable future for generations to come. The impact of climate change, as we know, is not limited to the African continent alone. It is a global issue that affects all of us. Thus. Addressing climate change in Africa, as President Ruto so, f so forcefully articulated, is a moral and strategic necessity for global climate action.
That's President Kufuado there. Awola Sewa is co-founder of Eco-Conscious Citizens. He, she's uh, an environmentalist uh, joining us on Zoom. Shortly, we'll cross over live to Nairobi, where my colleague Eric Maunag Beta is also connecting with us um, to give us a roundup of what this summit has been doing, especially with the Ghanaian perspective in there. But Awola, thank you for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. So this is the president saying that the fight against illegal mining is yielding positive results. Is it a true reflection of the situation on the ground from what you're seeing? Certainly, from where we are coming from, that is the exact opposite. The illegal miners seem to have invaded our forest reserves. Communities are being terrorized. Our forests are being pillaged. We all saw the documentary Forest Under Siege. So I really do not understand which country the president is referring to. It cannot be Ghana. The Republic of Ghana, really. Uh, uh, if you can reposition for me, I will have, uh, you're freezing a bit. It's a president. And so, yes, he's talking about Ghana, just to put it on record. So if he was speaking about the situation in Ghana, is what is he being told and what is he seeing that it's informing his position that the fight is improving, that, that we, are, we are not seeing? Well, it's, it's uh, as I said, he's certainly not referring to Ghana because the president knows. The president is very much aware that there's no real fight going on against illegal mining. The illegal miners have taken over various communities. Just a few days ago, three young people were shot, were shot by... Uh, uh, agents of Chinese illegal miners in the northwestern region. It's a uh, century abrogovi. One was killed, two are in hospital. These young men were honestly putting their lives on the line to try and stop illegal mining. I haven't really heard much. We are now told that the perpetrator, the one who pulled the trigger, is in police custody. But initially, it's rather the brother of the deceased, believe it or not, who was arrested. So we can see what is happening, uh, murders taking place, our forests disappearing, the brilliant documentaries, and I really need to, to thank the press for highlighting these issues. So for the president to make these comments in Kenya, it's really, um, I don't really, I can't find the words. He's our president and we need to talk about him respectfully. But if anybody else had made this statement, I would have said this is an outright lie. But we are referring to our president, and we have to be respectful. Okay, so, but, well, it's either he's um, telling the truth or otherwise. So, if, if what he's saying is, is not a reflection of the reality of the situation on the ground, then what else can it be? It's certainly not the case. It's certainly not the case. I think every Ghanaian would confirm that the illegal mining is going on blatantly. The community mining is, in, in some respects, a legalization of illegal mining. That's why we've asked for a pause on community mining. If we really want to wait to win the fight, we need to be serious about it. We need to look at Professor Frimpong Boateng's report. What has been the outcome? What has been the outcome? Akonta mining, destroying parts of the Tano Nimiri Forest Reserve. Has there been any accountability? How can we be winning any war when uh, People do what they like, destroy our forests, and there's absolutely no accountability. Obviously. Well, see, but I, 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 will, I want to understand this. We've seen this a number of times where or, or the president or the Minister of Lands and Natural Resources would go to an international program, a summit, conference, and they'll go and say the same things. It's not the first time we've heard this, that the fight against illegal mining is going well, our forests are being protected, and so on. Is it that the international community or the audience at these summits outside of Ghana don't have a way of verifying what they are told about the state of forests and illegal mining in countries? Challenge these statements. It's unfortunate that there was no independent person there to say that actually this is not the reality. These are videos of what is actually taking place. And I'm sure the, the, the audience knows that what he was saying does not reflect the facts. And maybe we need to be more vocal about publicly challenging these statements because it would seem that we are mocking Ghanaians. And that is what um, it, uh, our survey has shown, that Ghanaians feel they are being laughed at 
they are being mocked by the president because you cannot make these statements when you know that they are not reflecting the true situation. Either you don't care, and if you don't know what is happening, then how can you put your presidency on the line when you, when the situation is worse than it was when you said we are putting the presidency on the line and no serious action is being taken? I keep on saying that well-placed persons are involved in the illegal mining, and that, that is why Professor Boateng's uh, report, uh, report sat on somebody's desk for two years. We are mm. asking for a public inquiry so that we it's transparent and uh, the true facts come out and the perpetrators are prosecuted and jailed. That is the only way that we will stop illegal mining. mining. But we're not going to win the war. We can have fantasies and saying we're winning the war, but we okay. know that it's a clear and truth. That is right. not the, the, the situation on the ground. Aula, thank we just you. need to watch uh, the documentary, indeed. Our Forest uh, Under Siege. Uh, uh, that's right. Uh, Aula, uh, so, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us, an environmentalist and also one of the co-founders of Ecoconscious um, Ghana. And let's cross over to Nairobi now. My colleague, Eric Mawenaibeta, who is covering this um, Africa Climate Summit for us here at Media General, joining us. Eric, thank you for staying up. It's, I understand it's uh, around 2 a.m. In, in Nairobi where you are. What's the, the summit so far impact with respect to the Ghanaian perspective? What has it been so far since the summit started? And so the Ghanaian perspective, uh, this um, Africa Climate Summit, the inaugural Africa Climate Summit, has been how Ghana can play a significant role in absorbing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, a process really that has now come to be known as carbon trade or carbon marketing. And so uh, already it's open knowledge that in January we received some 4.8 million US dollars uh, following what has been described as verified and approved uh, trade of carbon where the forest reserves that we have and the number of trees that we have uh, it measured or there was a global standard to which uh, a measurement was done as to how much tons of carbon dioxide the trees in Ghana had been able to suck in and remove from from the atmosphere and so that's the 4.8 million US dollars that we received and that generally has been a part of the conversation uh, which has been lingering from the different representatives uh, who have come from the Ghanaian delegation, obviously led by the president, Nanado Dankwe Kufuaro, that's been the Lands and Natural Resources Minister, Samuel Jinapa, the Environment Minister as well, Mkuswe Friye, and then the Energy Minister, Ma Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe, and Minister of State in Charge of Finance, uh, Dr. Amin Adam, amongst others. That's been the, the, the large, the, the, the first part of the conversation, really. How Ghana can contribute uh, to reducing the carbon emissions, thereby making money for itself. And that's where the President mentioned that within the next two years, we're seeking to plant up to 30 million trees with the youth being employed to engage in this, to provide jobs as well for them. That, so that's the one part. The second leg really has been one that feeds into the general conversation in the lead up to the summit and all throughout the summit as well, having to do with creating a level playing field in the global financial markets. With the, the general consensus and the belief is that Africa has a lot of natural resources that has not been recognized in terms of our GDP as a continent. It provides trillions of dollars worth of investment and even contributions to the GDP of the continent, which could become significant in terms of the entire conversation, debt to GDP ratio and the likes. We in Ghana have suffered uh, that bit where we were forced to run to the IMF. The IMF said our debts were unsustainable. As such, we had to renegotiate a number of our debts with people suffering cuts, which has contributed as well to the 55 billion CDs loss as posted by the central bank. And so we're seeking to have all of that reformed then we can see our natural resources form a part of our GDP, which will expand our economies, and then we can be able to go on to these financial markets and get access to loans and develop our
uh, for this update. Eric Mayo and I are connecting with us live from Nairobi uh, covering this Africa Climate Summit for us here at Media General. Appreciate your time. Go get some sleep. It's, it's 2 a.m. in Nairobi where you are. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to say thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Make a date, same time tomorrow. But there's new day tomorrow as well. And together with the team here on Ghana Tonight, thank you for staying with us. I am Alfred Kansi. Have a good night. Ghana Tonight is brought to you by Flamingo Paint. Superior durability. Superior hiding. Superior coverage. Simply superior.